right? I, I think that they should figure out what that boundary is on their own. And so it, it's not in the rules. So, but it was starting to come out, starting to be known, starting to be talked about. So when I saw your list, uh, my my gut reaction to the like to it was like, hey, he threw Benjins in here. I I'm a Bear Necessities fan by nature, so I, I would have been playing it anyway. But I definitely saw the Benjins going. No one's really played Benjo. We want to encourage that, and so I don't believe that I had the 100 perfect version because it wasn't mass adopted yet. Okay. Um, but even across other decks, like how are you feeling about, you think they're, they're in a good position? You think maybe they're underplayed, overplayed? Where are you at with them? No, the artists were like, that's the card. If you can't see it, that's going on the playmat, nothing else. Everybody, welcome back to the Forbidden Mountain. Today we have a special interview with the winner of this CCS 8K tournament, Zan Sied. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Oh, I'm doing awesome. fantastic. So we're a couple of days removed, well, actually about a, a full week removed now from the win. Um, you know, what was it like playing in the tournament? How was the tournament scene there? You know, what are, what are your, some of, some of your, your stories of the week in there? Oh, man, it was amazing, amazing vibes. Super amazing community. Um, loved running into a lot of people that I've played against on, on Pixelborn, but haven't, hadn't met. And people apparently traveled from all over. My finals opponent was actually from the Bay Area, which was, oh, wow. nice. which I didn't realize people traveled across the country for. So it's really That's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, the uh, it's not too shocking to me because like, I've gone to a couple of the SCGs now and there's been people from you know from all over traveling even the, the Star City 5Ks also. So mm-hmm. traveling to Atlanta or, well, Georgia for an 8K, it's not too shocking. Pretty soon we'll all be traveling though, right? Yeah, I mean, we got a pretty <laughs> insane announcement. We have an Atlanta, yeah. Atlanta tournament for, for and and another and then a Chicago one, which is yeah, super exciting. Not too far, not too far. All right, sir. So let's gonna break right down into your deck list here. So you played uh, the Yellow Steel songs set three flutes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Flutes is a card that early on in the Rise of the Floodborne metagame picked up a huge, you know, picked up a big win uh, at PAX Unplug. So here we are again, a couple months later, Flutes back into the market. And, you know, we were just talking before we started here, and you were saying that your win rate against Ruby Amethyst was 75% going into the tournament. So is that like a main influence for the reason for playing this list? Yeah, so my thought process behind all of uh, all of it was I need to beat Ruby Amethyst. Um, that that's like the number one thing. But I I felt like going into this uh, going into this weekend, I thought of the format as a rock paper scissors format. So those of you that are familiar with Magic, there was like a common that's like a common occurrence. I think that in Modern there was like a you know dread. I'm trying to think of what the I think it was like Dredge Tron phoenix yeah meta. Okay. and so in this it was what what i believed was yellow steel purple red and blue red so i believe that before this tournament that the purple red uh ruby amethyst versus sapphire um Saf- sapphire ruby um lined up uh in favor of uh ruby amethyst and then uh Yellow Steel beat Ruby Amethyst, and then, um, what do you call it? And Sapphire Ruby beat uh, Yellow yellow Steel. So I was thinking, what's going to show up at this tournament the most of? I thought it was going to be Purple Red, just because it's been the most popular deck in Atlanta. So um, I... I was capable of and I capable of playing all three of them and I had good lists for all three, but I had to just decide what was going to be the high most represented thing and just try to beat that. And uh yeah. My matchup against pro- blue steel blue red was actually thirty percent um over Were you just able to dodge it? No, I actually played it against it round one. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and they won the die roll. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but before the tournament, what what my goal was, I need to make the blue red matchup at least a 50 50. And the sure. way I was able to do that was I was originally playing like Mr. Shmi okay. and more Rapunzel's. Right. And um, I wasn't playing uh, Bare Necessities 
Um, I wasn't playing the Benjas. Okay. And I needed to add that package. And I also added, um, what do you call it? Uh, the the criminal, the criminal, criminal, mind. criminal mind. Yep. I added that because you needed to be able to deal with the crab with the world's greatest criminal mind, right? Uh, Tamatoa. Yep. And then if you're able to snag um, Fishbone, uh, Fishbone Quill with, on 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 your turn two, um, with bare necessities, that's a complete game changer. And then Benja, just making their um, Hammer Shams just not be able to draw two, just completely change the match. And even even potentially late in the game, getting rid of dimes is like oh it's not yeah. the worst thing ever. <laughs> no, that's that feels great. I mean, it just makes Tamatoa less of a threat overall, sure. right? It's not gonna be. It, it, you're just trying to make it. A lot less and they have to wipe the board so hades um bringing back benja was extremely extremely relevant in that matchup specifically and so my goal was to just make it a 50 50. so i was able to make it a 50 50 with the 20 match sample size and i was yeah, able to it was really interesting because i felt like leading up to the week you know we we came off a week where ruby sapphire wasn't crazy successful but it definitely gained some traction uh, well, it was but, number one on the ladder and number two. Yeah, like, so it, it was having some success online. It did have uh, ripples of success at Star City Games um, in Philly. So it was really starting to come out. But it was definitely, like, still, I think, like, mostly under the radar. Like, it wasn't, like, I don't even think it was in the top five, uh, like, top eight decks from the week. But it was starting to come out, starting to be known, or starting to be talked about. So when I saw your list... Uh, my my gut reaction to the like to it was like, hey, he threw Benjins in here. I I'm a Bear Necessities fan by nature, so mm-hmm. I, I would have been playing it anyway. But I definitely saw the Benjins going. No one's really played Benja like for the first month of of the meta game. So yeah. that coming in to me felt like an immediate reaction to just saying, I need to sure up this in some way, and at the very least, Benjins still a two three for three with two lore right like this is not the worst character you can be playing on turn three so it's okay but i also really like that the uh the hades is another card like hades is a card that i think over the course of the last three sets comes in and out of this deck quite often and it comes back in most commonly when the control matches are at a high and you can afford to like take some of the other uninkables out that you need it for your more aggro matchups because it's like it is absolutely one of the best cards ever against be prepared you're just like definitely like you're just like you're just constantly rotating threats you're like yep here's a guy here's a guy here's a guy so i really do enjoy that i also really respect the rapunzel thing i think that's another thing when you really look at this list a lot of people are like man i can't believe you only played one rapunzel it's like well in those matchups rapunzel's really not even that great and the best part about it is as long as they think you're playing rapunzel they have to respect it so you, you kind of get the best of both worlds out of it because they might play differently based on you having four Rapunzel's in your deck, and they don't know, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, Rapunzel is one of those cards that is completely game-changing. I completely agree with you. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, okay, so um, I was going to answer the Benja question. The, yeah. So Mi- Mr. Smee uh, was my original card in that slot, and so... I would. I did have to slow down the deck in order to include that. Bare, Bare Necessities is a, again another meta call card, which I'm not a big fan of in a whole new world deck. Sure, I'm a big fan of that card. Otherwise, I think I love the card. I think it's. I mean, duress song ability so beautiful and so fun to play with Cinderella. But I needed a reason for it. So if Blue Red didn't pop up. I, I don't think we end up on Bare Necessities and Benja. I actually actually think that Rapunzel and Mr. Shmee is more the angle I end up taking because, you know, Mr. Shmee deals a damage to himself in this deck every single time, and yeah. and Rap- Rapunzel is the cure for that. And um, yeah. She also works incredibly well with Robin Hood. I mean... Oh, man. So, like, so she's good. so good. So, like... <laughs> <laughs> but but the idea the, of Hades comes from um, if you think about uh, uh, set one, mm-hmm. right? Set one, there was a major tournament. It was I think it was the Apex Invitational. Okay. And blue yellow ended up um, winning that 
tournament and it was just hades spam exactly the key to beating purple red in that tournament was the hades spam exactly so people weren't unfamiliar there was an adaption right the adaption Mm -hmm. was if you're playing purple red you're actually supposed to use the broom to put the hades away from their graveyard yeah yeah right and so people didn't realize that i guess during the tournament and it was able to just uh, run away yeah um and so I was like, oh, they're not even playing Broom now. No. no. I need a Sherpa. Sure so my thought process is usually like, okay, if I don't, if I'm not whole new worlding all the time, could I win against Purple Red? And the mm-hmm. answer was no until I realized, oh, I can just keep doing Hades into Hades, even if I ended up not drawing the whole new world. Like, right. we didn't go down that path. And so that's how I came up with Yeah, that. I mean, repeatable threat is a repeatable threat. And the deck... Even though it has all the answers in the world to it, it's still like, well, I'm just gonna slam another one. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's just gonna keep coming. And the deck takes so long to win, right? Like Ruby Amethyst isn't a fast deck anymore. It doesn't. It can't just turn the table, especially now with like the lucky dime aspect of what Blue Red's doing and saying, hey, I'm gonna like gain five or six lore, uh, you know, a turn if you don't answer this. Ruby Amethyst doesn't really have that luxury right now. So since they don't have that luxury, you can definitely slow yourself down and say, well, I'll just, if you're going to go slow, I'm going to go slow, but I can pressure you along the way and always force you to have multiple answers to my cards. So I think Hades is a really, really great call for the meta. Yeah. Funny story from the tournament. I played against a um, great Magic player slash Lorcana player, Matt Wright, and I missed my third ink. Ooh. And I and I ended up winning because I my hand was just, Flutes, right? I went flute on two, don't have a third ink. Flute on three, don't have uh, uh, have the third ink. And then from that point forward, I just became this control deck, which was uh, play a song, uh, banish your character, use my flutes, just over and over and over again until I ended up winning. So speaking of this, uh, missing my turn on my, my inkable on turn three. Mm-hmm. There's 21 inkables in this deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I totally get it, right? And I mean, like, all these cards are insanely powerful. Yeah. Uh, I think very early on in uh, Chapter 1, I was playing a similar flute deck that was, like, uh, like 22 or 23 on inkables. And this was in Chapter 1. It was still, like, unheard of. But you could see it even then that this type of play is absolutely possible. But yeah. I'd really love, I, I really want to give you the opportunity to explain how you arrived at 21 Inkables. So number one thing, I don't believe that um, we should like create rules that create so many restrictions. Because when new players come into the game and they like present someone, someone who, like the person who's teaching them the game with a deck and we give them these rules of like, hey, you can't have more than this many Inkables. What it does is it, stifles their growth in a way right I, I think that they should figure out what that boundary is on their own and so it, it's not in the rules so a uh, quick question for you mm-hmm. do you feel that that is like a natural creation builder concept so like clearly you just brought 21 inkables um to to a tournament you're comfortable doing that do you think that people actually restrict themselves into it because they're uncomfortable? Yeah. It, 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 you will never figure out what the boundary for each, every, every deck has to have a different boundary. The reason why is because your purple, uh, your Ruby Amethyst deck has a seven mana uninkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, my max uninkable is a five oh, one that I can cast you with. Can, you can literally sing for free. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Like uh, our goals and the need for our, uh, the amount of inkable, like the amount of things I need to ink. Like I win games without inking, uh, having a fourth or fifth card that I inked, right, all the time. So we just have a different um, objective, and I think that if you place that on every color, it doesn't pan out equally. We all end up with these weird control decks, which we kind of already see, right? Like. If, if, if everybody's applying these rules, they're always going to end up on the ones that benefit those colors. Right. And we see it in with blue, red, and purple, red. Those are, those are just mirror images of themselves. 
right? right? And so, um, like, I think that if you take the theory behind this deck and then maybe apply it to green steel, mm -hmm. you get its counterpart. And it's a different way of, different philosophy of deck building. Yeah. And um, we want to encourage that. And so I don't believe that I had the 100% perfect version because it wasn't mass adopted yet, right? The more people working on a deck, they will always be better than one person working on a deck. Sure. I, I present a philosophy of deck building, but the people are going to make the best version of it. And I think that, I think Savich recently hit number one with the deck. And one of the cuts that he made was Hades, uh, one Hades for the second Rapunzel, mm -hmm. which I think that if he had presented that to me in, before the tournament, I would have maybe agreed with him because the thing um, I just didn't have the lu that luxury of working with a uh, working with a player that was sure. um, thinking uh, like at the same level. At the, like I just didn't have the luxury of that many people working on it because uh, again, that's that's kind of something I'm trying to cultivate now with the, with with creating a Discord and um, I just want to have a conversation with as many people as possible and at, see as many decks as possible because. Um, yeah, I think that this is just the the beginning of deck building. But I think because 20... you said it. Go ahead, tell us about Club Lorcana. Club Lorcana. This is a, a Discord that I created actually a week before the tournament, and I made it just for friends um, that were playing Lorcana and friends that I was trying to convince to come play Lorcana instead of Magic. And um, fair. And then um, after this tournament, people were messaging me a lot on what my thought process was and. I had to give it credit for the success. I think that a lot of, you know, I think that as a as a deck builder, I can just get in my own head and just I don't want to, I don't want to believe that something I create is the only thing that can be good for a deck. Sometimes there's there is the best deck, and I should play that deck, and I need people around me to help me realize that. And um, I feel like I want to share. Uh, what I have. So if we like develop that trust, then we both end up getting to the answer quicker. So I feel like it's a good mutual relationship. So I opened that up to the public because I think that the more people that are involved in this information seeking thing, it will be better for all of us. So yeah, that's fair. I like that. Um, so speaking of giving information, uh, you went through the effort of creating not one version of this, but two versions of it. And then when I joined Club Lorcana Day, I saw that someone else took it and did a whole other version of this. I made a way beautiful, <laughs> super beautiful. <word. laughs> so walk me through um, this mulligan strategy here. Okay. So the first thing I want to preface it by saying, like, don't take this 100% literally. It's just like... It's just trying to, like, give you it's the guide. Extreme. Yeah, it's, it's a guide. kind of it's, it's it's a it's up for debate, but it's it it is like general concepts of saying, hey, this is on average good. Yeah. So what it's telling you, if you if you look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's your like ideal hand. But there are exceptions. Like for example, if I have. Uh, queen plus shift queen, right? So that's uh, the queen commanding presence and the queen regal monarch. If I have that, then w would I mulligan away uh, any number of aerials after the first one? No, I would keep all four of those aerials. So what it's trying to do is like, like you're not trying to get exactly that hand every single time. It's just telling you like what I prioritize and how I prioritize it in just the opener and that priority changes um right after the mulligan right because grab your sword is going to be great in the amber steel mirror match but i just can't afford it being an uninkable uh, that early right um let the storm rage on again it's number two but i wouldn't want past the first copy just like i would want for aerials uh, because it's uninkable, but I want that combo 100%. So you have to like, it is a little bit more complicated, but 
uh, Lorcana is inherently much more complicated because of the, the inkable system. But right. I just wanted people to, to be able to think about how I value cards just from the opener. And I think that, um, that once we start digesting information like this, it will, it'll make players a lot better quicker. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because I think the mulligans are likely the most skill intensive part of the game. Uh, and it's also because your mulligan might change on the play going second, uh, every single matchup, as you, as we saw here, like in this, in this graph, you have every matchup laid out, or at least every assumed matchup laid out that you were either a had information for, or had expectations to play against is my guess. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, it was just what I had run into on the ladder or what other people in the discord slash friends had, um, presented. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting that you can, you know, we can come up with this, right. And obviously like, you know, we see Amber Steel songs, we see Ruby Amethyst Control. How much does this change if Ruby Amethyst Control is playing castles or isn't playing castles? How do you okay. ever know if your opponent's even doing that, right? So it, it's definitely impossible to go, I this is a strict answer and it, you should always follow it because you don't have all the information all the time and you have to think on the fly. So if you if you learn a piece of information in game one the average player is not going to adapt and utilize it for game two if they're just strictly going off of this right yeah you're you are exactly right like and uh an example i often use is like ruby amethyst um ruby amethyst uh no no, not ruby amethyst uh amber ruby has so many different versions to it one of the versions has um lantern in it and the lantern version you would want benja so your prior, you, where where you prioritize that completely changes based off of if you saw that in uh, in game one at all in the game or yeah. outside of the game, what, right? Like, yeah, like know. if you just have the prior knowledge, yeah, yep, yeah. So it is crazy though because you know, and you you actually you you eventually updated it yourself and yeah. you modified it. Now the link is in the description. I promise it'll be there. <laughs> um, is there anything that you really wanted to add on to this information though? So I started adding notes on the left side yeah. to just like uh, just to help people understand what their role is, mm-hmm. and I want people to just get into the mindset of your role can always change in Lorcana. Everything, I think that the best decks are always going to have are have a bunch of different roles that they can take at different times. I think that the reason why we don't see aggro succeed to the highest level always is okay. because we want it to be multidimensional. I think of Steel Song as an aggro deck that is multidimensional. Sure. So um, I just want people to know that, like, you know, whether you're on the play or the draw or whatever the um, the circumstances in that moment are, like, identify your role because, like, if you don't know you're the aggressor and you're playing, like, the control, but you're actually being controlled, like, you, you've lost the game before you even started playing. Yeah, I mean, I think Amber Steel is a very special type of deck. And I, I think that there are versions of Ruby Amethyst that can also do this. But the deck has the full ability to be an aggro deck. And it also has the full ability to be a control deck. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It, it's crazy to say it like that. But it really does have all the tools that when necessary, you decide what like what mode you're in. And I think that... That's what makes the deck so powerful. Um, and I think it's harder for Ruby Amethyst to do that in this set, but in Chapter 2, it was very capable of just being oh, yeah. an aggro beatdown. Like, you're just, like, mini-go, you know, it, just evasive get- character. Go- like, <laughs> yeah. it, it was... So that's why I think it was so powerful. So I do say that, like, the Amber Steel versions of this are um, are, are definitely capable of, of playing that role, which is, I mean, that's it's really good in card games. If you can... You can change modes. You can you know when you're supposed to be the aggressor, when you're supposed to be in troll. That's, that's really good. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, all right, sir. Good. Shift mechanics are, I mean, are they're just going to continue to get crazier? And I mean, we don't even have to go past aerial. Just the shift mechanic there is just gonna get crazier. <laughs> I mean, shift is a. 
I mean, it's a core mechanic of Lorcana that's phenomenal, right? Oh yeah, I love it. And and I, honestly, this deck in embo- like the Amber Steel list in like in general embodies Lorcana for me. Shift is it's an ability in Lorcana that's exclusive to Lorcana that's so very interesting. And then Singer, I mean, is just oh singing like, is so amazing. Some of the cards in this game that are our song, they're just they're just unfair. <laughs> Oh my god, yeah. They're just, they're just unfair, right? <laughs> oh my god, the best divination ever. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a hell of a it's a hell of a mechanic. That's that's for sure. All right, that's so amazing. If you're unfamiliar, right, we like to have fun on this channel. We like to play yes. a couple games in our interviews. So this game is called Repeat After Me. So I'm gonna say a statement and then you're gonna repeat the statement and include your answer to it. I'm gonna repeat the statement. And then include my ans- uh, my answer to it. Okay, got it. All right. So, the best part about winning the CCS 8K was? The best part of winning the CCS 8K was that I didn't split it. I actually heard about this. Um, I heard my teammate was interested in splitting. Actually, you played my teammate, I believe, in the top eight, uh, George. Yeah, I was and- interested in splitting, too. Yeah, so I heard that there was a group that was interested in splitting and a group that wasn't, and then you guys played it out, and it totally worked out in your favor. Yep. Uh, I So George was in the first round of my first round. Yeah, top eight, yeah. Super awesome, dude. Um, George is awesome. Shout out yeah, to George. Yeah, super, super. I, I think he won the 5K, right? He did, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah congrats to him again. Um, yeah, super awesome opponent. Yeah, so my mindset going into that was let's split top eight so I, I can so, so we can all play in the 2k right right that was the mindset um but our match went so fast that he was able to play in the 2k so it ended up being a win-win situation fair all right uh number two the thing i enjoy most about disney lorcana is uh the thing i like uh, the thing I enjoy most about Disney Lorcana is um, the community. I mean, I made a Discord. Um, I'm going back to the local stores. I go to shout out uh, Gubu and Wasteland Gaming. I mean, they're, they're and of course CCS, uh, yeah. but they're, they're only open on Saturdays and Sundays. So, okay, that's cool. Uh, what is your local scene like? Do you have um yeah like, what's your local uh, Lorcana uh, leagues like? Yeah, Gubu. Um, I also go to Level Up. Um, so, what is it like? Um, so, on Mondays they have Level Up, which is like fifteen minutes away uh, from my office. Is uh, is uh, they do drafts on on Monday, and then Thursday they have the the league days. It's a pretty casual scene, mm-hmm. and then on Fridays Gubu has a pretty competitive scene, and so. I kind of get a taste of both. Um, I've only really had time these these days. Work has been busy um, for Fridays, so I've been able to go to Guba. And plus, whenever there's a tournament coming around, you want you want to go to the more competitive place to get into that mindset and just like and practice. Like one thing about Lorcana is like time is really important. So being able to go to the local scene and practice those things. What I mean by that is I try to untap like my ink inkwell and my items during my opponent's turn to like save time. Um, I also notice that players often ask you how many cards are in your hand. So I like to usually put my hand down and then put a dice over my hand in- indicating how many cards are in my hand. And mm-hmm. so those things are like dexterity things. So I like to practice those before the tournament because um yeah, my goal in every match is like if there are fifty minutes and all fifty minutes are eaten, I I want to be in the twenty like I take twenty five minutes and I give my opponent thirty five minutes, and I think that generally means I'll never I'll never will never go to time, mm-hmm. um, and so I don't think I went to time I went to time zero times in this entire tournament, and I think that you know like. Uh, since my opponent can't do anything during my turn and I can't do anything during 
their turn, um, we can we can speed up the game by doing actions during the, their turn. So I like to practice yeah. those too. That's very fair. I like that. That's some good tips too, for what it's worth for anyone's listening. Um, the deck I currently never want to play against is the deck I currently don't want to play against is Sapphire Ruby. Okay. Why? How come? What's the what's with that matchup? It's a fifty-fifty. I don't like the coin flip. Okay. Yeah, I don't like the coin flip. I I have made it into a fifty-fifty, but um, you know, I I, I want to take I want to try and win, and um, I don't want to always be sweating. Oh, I hope they don't play popsicle on one. Um, what do you call it? One jump ahead on two, and and then their three is um play Hiram. <laughs> yeah, they, they can either play the Hiram or um like even cool. more punishing than Hiram is uh, usually um Fishbone. Yeah. Right, because it may it just turns off my whole new world. So Yeah, if they can just re- respond to it well, yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. That's fair. After a month of playing with Into the Inklands, I feel locations are after playing a month in into the Inklands, I feel locations are fair. Uh, so obviously you didn't play any in your deck this weekend. Amber Steel is not really common for playing them. However, a teammate of mine is very influenced of a deck that you've been playing recently, and he's very much into the idea of playing by you in your list. Oh, nice. That was so my how- week. How have you have you ever tried buy you in the list at all? Oh, so the very first weekend I top, went to CM Games with Kendall. We we drove up and then we both top four split that tournament and I played four by you week one. And uh-huh. um um and so um the card is extremely good at filtering your hand, playing around, be prepared. Um but the issue is cards like um, Madame Mim, Fox, right? And then Maui. Yeah. It, it just always enables those cards. Sometimes you can play your deck in a way that you're able to play around those cards. And then it just makes your whole deck, like, it makes your locations, like, just a liability. Hmm. It's everything a liability. Very fair. Very fair. But if overall, the you it could come back. What was that? I say if the bounce package was a lot less prevalent, it could come back. Okay, um, but even across other decks, like how are you feeling about? You think they're they're in a good position? You think maybe they're underplayed, overplayed? Where are you at with them? Um, uh, sorry, uh, could you repeat? So that in general, locations. Period. Yeah. Right. Like across deck building. Oh, yeah. uh, like how do you fi- like how do you find yourself playing them in in other decks? Oh, I love them in, I, I mean, blue, red, uh, sapphire, ruby control. McDuck Manor is beautiful in that deck, fits in perfectly. I think that um, the only reason why Ruby Amethyst isn't playing more locations like RLS is because of the mirror match, right? It's like Maui's hook is a location killer, right? Sorry. Like Maui plus Maui's hook annihilates every, every location. So... If the mirror match wasn't so prevalent, I think locations would be much better. I think Jim Hawkins, if someone's playing two of those, that becomes a liability for anybody who's playing Whole New World, right? Because yeah. there's a way to put nine power into uh, onto the battlefield and that. Yeah, it's it's almost similar to like replicating what you're doing by singing a song for free. Exactly. But Jim Hawkins on his own is not great because it's like card disadvantage in a way. And you yeah. have, and the decisions that you make in order to uh, allow that to happen usually end up being a net negative. Very fair. Uh, last one. The one thing I hope to see in Ursula's return is? One thing that I would like to see in Ursula's return is... Um, I feel like they, they showed me everything that I want to see. Already? For 17 cards, bro. <laughs> I know, but... Uh, oh, oh, I got I, it. I, 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 um, I want to see a character that destroys locations. Like, okay, I want to so see... When, uh, when this comes into play, just banish a location? 
Yeah, I don't. You have uh, a character in mind that does that? Like a hmm, a titan. I don't know which. which yeah, I can one. I can buy into that. It has to be something big, right? Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be bulky. Maybe maybe they could bring back Cerberus. Yeah, I mean, I I take another Cerberus. Why not? Yeah, I'm all for it. I like it. I like it. Okay. All right. So another quick game that we play is uh really simple. Just would you rather? I'm gonna put two cards in the screen. We're gonna talk about them, and you tell me which one you are more likely to play. Okay. Okay. Two new cards. We got Goofy, Goofy. and Mulan. Goofy, Goofy, Goofy. Tell me how good Goofy is. <laughs> Goofy is uh, <laughs> Goofy is so insane. <laughs> Goofy is so insane. It's so insane. I don't even know how to. If you thought that you know, if you think that the goat is good, then Goofy is like Goofy's a goat on crack. <laughs> It's so good. I don't want to see this card at all, but it it's so good. Yeah, this card seems pretty good. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely agree with you on that one. All right, this one's a little a little maybe a little more difficult. <laughs> uh, Hans or Anna? I need to read these again. Um, if you have another hero character in play, character gets plus one lore. Hmm. Okay, and it's a one four. No. When you play this character, if a princess or queen is in play, gain one lore. I like the Hans more, but I don't think I, I, I can't imagine either of them. Well, I can imagine the Hans seeing play. Like, if you think about set one, blue, yellow, mm-hmm. that's where I would put Hans. But then Anna would see play in that deck, too. So hard. This one's tough. I'll be honest. I think this one's tough. Dang. So like Anna is slightly above rate if you can pair her with the heroes because a two a two two cost one four with two lore is definitely above rate on average. Yeah. But there is a world where repeating Hans in like the Amethyst bounce package might get you some leverage. So it I think it's pretty tough. Yeah, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna go. I'm with happy. Anna. I'm happy to say that there might be an Anna. That might be an Anna that is actually playable. So I'm gonna choose Anna. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm with you. I'm. A, I'm on Team Anna. I'm on Team Anna. We know that threes are overloaded and twos yeah, are, are twos are hard to come by. And yeah, I, like I said I think her stat for for the ability, if if it's, it seems easy enough on paper. So I, I think that like her stat lines for two lore seem seem pretty good. Yeah. Obviously, still dies the fox, but everything does. All right, yeah. this last one's pretty difficult, but it's also pretty easy. If we take the fact away of where you have to finish in a tournament, okay, mm-hmm. which one? Right, let's take away top oh, sixteen, top thirty-two. Yeah. Which one of these do we really want more? Rapunzel. Just because? Is it only because it's top sixteen though? No, no, beautiful. Art. Okay, okay, okay. Just making sure. I just wanted to make sure we didn't have the prizes included. Look That's at all. the hair. The hair just. Just it's so, so good, right? I mean, they're, so I think good. they're both beautiful, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a reason why it's also the the playmat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the, the play, dude, the playmat's foil. What's up no, with that? It means that the artists agree that that's the best card. That's the best <laughs> <Is> card. <laughs> <laughs> so who are we to say that the art is good if the artists themselves believe that the artists? That's are very good fair. Playmat, that's yeah. very very fair. I mean, I'm sure Robinsberger had some say, but. <laughs> No, the artists were like, that's the card. If you can't see it, that's, that's going great. on the playmat, nothing else. I can respect that. So tell me a little bit about yourself, sir. How did we get to Disney Lorcana? What's our history in card games? Yeah, um, I I played Magic the Gathering before um, before Lor- Lorcana. Uh, I started playing in my undergrad. My roommates taught me how to play. They gave me... Um, probably the worst deck ever against the best deck ever. They had oh, a Jason that's... Mind Sculptor deck and uh, they gave me a white weenie deck. Oh, good, good, good roommates. Yeah. Yeah. But they beat the crap out of me. And then I went and sold my, you know, magic, uh, my Pokemon cards and Yu-Gi-Oh cards so I could build my own deck. Came back and I beat them. And then they were like, okay, you should go play FNM. 
I won that. Then they were like, you should go play in this bigger, this open. I top aided that and won that. And they were like, you should go play in the GP and then the pro tour and that the whole, uh, eventually I became invested enough to start my own team. Ended up becoming the player of the year in 2019. And then, um, uh, thanks. But then the pandemic happened. So all that. Yeah. Yeah. It ruined everything. Yeah. And, uh, that was a that was a great experience, but um, then my life kind of deviated from card games for 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 a bit, and um, and now I'm back on card games um, because Lorcana came about, um, and I was really curious about it um, because I, I I think that you know TCGs are lightning in a bottle, right? Like you have to have so many other factors. For competitive play to be viable, there needs to be um, an entire economy that's built off of people's love of not just winning, but and the way the game is played, but the the entire product, um, as, like as a whole. And Disney was able to capture capture that lightning in a bottle, and then the community kind of. It's like we're gonna run tournaments similar to the way Magic does, which I, which I do believe is you know like if people were to give up their Saturdays and Sundays, um, and like I do believe rewarding them with the, with with cash is like the best thing, right? Like I want them to be able to choose again to spend it on Lorcana, and I and I and I think that's such a beautiful thing, and so. Yeah, look like the Lokana community started running these tournaments, especially here in Atlanta. CCS just ran one Ks at the Wazoo and mm-hmm. eventually led it to eight Ks. And rumor has it that there's a ten K. Yeah, I've I've heard some rumors. I've heard some rumors. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, uh, like I kind of lost track of where we, <laughs> what I was saying. <laughs> I guess the uh, the end all be all is what. What was the like the I guess the key factor for Lorcana uh, yeah. over Magic now? Yeah, I, I, it's a natural evolution. I mean, they solved a lot of the problems in Magic, which was like getting mana uh, flooded or or screwed. Which is like you need to have lands which are equivalent to ink, but they're not so hard to explain. They're not versatile. <laughs> they're not characters. They're not things that yeah. do anything but our resources. Exactly, and you could draw too many or too little and not be able to play the game. And yeah, you you, you end up with very many non games. Yeah, or they the simplified the game. For non-games. They simplified and just elevated it to the next level. Like if this was algebra, you know, like they made calculus, but like an easy to understand calculus. Sure, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. I like that. It's not bad. Yeah, it's a beautiful game. I'm looking forward to it evolving. Uh, it's going to be a difficult process to continue to keep the same standard and abide by some of these rules. They could easily break them and the game could completely just become Pokemon. But um, sure, sure. Uh, at least the product will still look beautiful and great. <laughs> at least all the art's still good, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very fair. Uh is there anything else you'd like to add today, sir? Um, I just want to thank you. I mean, you've been such a kind and gracious host. Uh, really enjoyed talking to you even before we even started the podcast. And um, yeah, uh, thank you to the community. And uh, keep playing Lorcana, and we'll get better better together. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 you live in Atlanta. You already kind of said it. So we're definitely going to see you. And, uh, like, it's crazy enough, but two months, uh, it's not very far from now. So, that's yeah, good. No, I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> that's good. Uh, and then I guess, like, you've, the store is all put out for set champs and things like that. So, that'll be good in a couple of weeks. Because, you, I mean, you said there's so many stores around you that already support the game at that 1K level. You can only hope they're all going to be set championships to play in, too. Oh, yeah. No, there there are definitely going to be set championships. There's also, like, um, tournaments for enchanted cards as well. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a blast. Awesome. It's great to hear that you have a wonderful community that you're definitely helping it grow. Um, You know, huge congratulations to you for picking up the big win and really for anyone that has not looked at the guide yet, it's links in the description. You should check it out. Uh, I I was 
the reason I even messaged you because it's not very common for a winner to come out and explain to people why they won. So it really drew me to you because I'm like, you know what? I really want to have a conversation. Like I really want to get him and have him have the ability to explain why he's doing this thing. Uh, the Club Lorcana is another great addition. Like you're just really trying to build the community. And I think that's really wonderful and respectable. So congratulations again to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, guys. We'll see everyone in the next one.